some resources and tools. So I am biased by this great organization, but hands down, probably one of the best places for resources is the Beacon website. Um, whether it's finding a urologist, learning more about your treatment, finding other people's support groups, um, it really has everything you need in one place. All of these webinars are recorded and put up there. Um, it's really got a plethora of information, um, as well as, you know, information about local events, um, our big meetings, things like that. There are also a lot of other great websites out there, American Cancer Society, the AUA, and the American Bladder Cancer Society. Um, I... I like to emphasize these specific websites because Google can be a very dangerous place. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence. So, you know, someone's uncle's friend who had this horrible experience, um, which can falsely kind of taint your experience. So I just want everyone to have accurate information. And that's why I always direct my patients to these websites. Um, also, Beacon has a great mobile app. If you just go into the app store and type in bladder cancer, I think this is the first one that pops up. So um, it's nice because you can kind of read about different things in the palm of your hand, lots of different resources, um, and then lots of um, access to support. And then speaking of support, um, I think your bladder cancer journey um, even though it might not look like what other people's cancer journey looks like, say people who have muscle invasive cancer, for example, they have to get their bladder removed. They have to get the chemotherapy that you see in the movies with the IV and then losing the hair. But having non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, it can be a, a huge burden. You're seeing your urologist every couple of weeks at minimum, um, you're getting uh, chemotherapy instilled into your body, you know, at once a week for weeks at a time. You're going to and from the doctor. You're having, you can have symptoms that are very bothersome every day. So I think it's really important that you find support for yourself, whether that's a bladder cancer support group of other patients going through a similar thing or um, even mental health support. I think the mental health aspect of it is just as important as the physical. Sometimes as urologic oncologists, we focus on the physical because we just want your cancer to get better, but your mental health and being healthy um, in that kind of sense is just as important because if you um, feel good about what we're doing, you feel confident in us and you feel supported in yourself, then you're really gonna have better outcomes that way. Um, so, if that's not a mental health specialist, then your family or friends or church or whatever you need to get you through it. And then last but not least, your medical team, you know, we're here for you to help you find these resources. So don't feel like you can't ask your urologist or your nurse or nurse practitioner or PA um, different resources. And then the most important thing to remember is that even though we're advocating for you and your family and your friends are as well, that you really are your best advocate. Um, I tell all of my patients to keep a, a journal or a notebook on their phone or something of a running list of questions to ask me. Um, that is what I am here for. That is what your urologist is there for. Um, we want to know all of your concerns. We want to uh, you know, talk through all of them and make sure that you understand what's going on and are okay with what's going on and what kind of the next steps are. So um, write down your questions because they're going to pop into your head and I, you're going to forget them when you're in the office. So, and we want to go through those with you. Um, another important thing is to speak up, reach out to us if you're having um, trouble tolerating any part of your treatment. If you're having symptoms, I don't want them to get to the point where they're so bad you can't tolerate your treatment anymore and we have to find something else to do. Um, sometimes it's better if we know early on that you're having certain side effects because then we can try to stay on top of them. Or for example, if you can't tolerate the office cystoscopies anymore, let your urologist know. I have lots of patients where because of the treatment that they had, it's just too painful for them to get it done in the office. No big deal. I take them to the operating room. It's a quick 20 minutes. They come home later that day. 
So really speak up for yourself. Let your doctor know what you are and are not comfortable with. And ask for clarification. So um, I think if you know what your treatment plan is and what the next steps are, you're going to get the best care. So ask for clarification. Ask why we're doing things, why we're not doing certain things. Um, because like I said, if you're confident in the care that you're getting, um, I think you're going to have better outcomes. And um, the other thing I always tell my patient is do not feel like you are bothering me. It is our job to help you. So advocate for yourself, speak up for yourself, um, and, um, you know, let us help you get the best care that um, we can give you. So that is the end of my talk. I hope I covered everything and I'll let Patricia kind of take it back over. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Sadian, for such a comprehensive and excellent presentation. As a reminder to our listeners, if you have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And I see we already have some questions, Dr. Hayden, so we're gonna go right into the Q&A. Um, first, I wanna ask you, um, there's, there's, there's a question about blue light and, and white light. Um, before we address the question, can you explain the difference between the two and their yeah. response, if any? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's a very good question. So white light is um, just kind of the light we're using right now. It's the regular light that we plug into our cystoscope. Blue light is um, where we you have a special chemical injected into your bladder and then we use a blue light. It's just using a different spectrum of light. And what it does is the tumor cells pick up on, um, or I'm sorry, the chemical gets picked up by tumor cells that we might not be able to see with our own eye, but that the blue light can pick up on. So this is often used at the, uh, usually the re-resection TURVT. So, um, it can help us find tumors that we might not be able to see with our naked eye. And it's usually used in that re-resection phase. Um, some people, for example, our institution doesn't have it in our office. We can use it in the operating room. So that that's why I use it in re-resection. Some places have it in the office. So your office cystoscopy, uh, just your standard rechecks might use blue light. Basically, it's just a new, it's a newer technology that um, can help us identify tumors that we might not be able to see with just the regular cystoscope. Thank you for explaining that. And is there a benefit um, on whether um, there are some advantages of having um, blue light um, for depending if you're at high risk or intermediate or low risk? Um, so yeah, it's typically used more in the intermediate and high risk because it's better at picking up kind of like CIS or high grade disease. Um, low grade disease might not take it up as much, but um, so that's usually in the setting that it's used in higher grade disease, but there is a role for it in low grade. Um, but again, um, it's mostly used for those high risk or intermediate risk patients that are usually getting the re-resections. Thank you. Now, you, you talked a little bit about risk factors and genetics. Um, there's uh, some questions about gen a tumor genomic profile. Can, can you go into explaining what that is, what that entails, um, and, and explaining its role in, um, in decision for treatment and bladder cancer? Yeah, so there are some, uh, you know, we're using a lot more genomic profiles and kind of different um, uh, urine testing, cytology testing based on those genomic profiles. Um, a lot of the ongoing trials are currently using those. Um, and what they can help do is help us um, be better at predicting who's going to recur and also who's going to respond to what treatment. We don't really have, um, the reason those are being used in those trials is because we don't necessarily have the answers yet on a larger scale. A lot of those are kind of been preliminarily studied. But I think in the future, 
what it's going to entail is um, everyone will get genomic profiling of their tumor and they'll have a more tailored treatment. Right now, as you can see, it's really broad strokes. Like if you fall into this risk category, this is the treatment you get. But we will be moving towards a more personalized medicine based on different tumor markers, that based on different genomic profiling. I kind of didn't get into that with this talk since this was more of a broad brush stroke talk about it, but um, there is definitely a role for it in diagnosis, um, especially in patients who might have recurrences. Thank you. Uh, and uh, you, well, there's a question about uh, changes in, in diet. Um, do you have any recommendations around um, uh, the, the role of nutrition and um, whether it you know uh, it it it's it, it's affected or what dietary changes people should should take. Yeah, so a lot of the dietary stuff is especially the risk factors is based on like large scale pattern observations and kind of correlations, right? We can't say like, if you eat bacon every day, you will get bladder cancer. But a lot of it was just found that, you know, um, a diet full of highly processed foods, um, those patients had a higher risk of bladder cancer. Of course, they might, there might be other things leading to an unhealthy lifestyle that add to it. So I think once you do have bladder cancer though, um, what we have been finding is there is evidence of um, a more, for lack of better terms, a more vegan diet, plant-based foods have been shown to be healthier for all types of blood or of all types of cancers. And I don't think bladders excluded from that. Now, do I think radically changing your diet is going to cure your cancer? No, I think, but I think, um, you know, leading a more healthy lifestyle will probably help in terms of your overall tolerance of things, your overall health, um, and kind of, you know, the having just a more nutritious diet is going to be better for you overall. But kind of that one-to-one -one link isn't there. It's just kind of patterns that have been observed. Thank you. Now, we didn't really go into clinical trials. Um, and I, I was curious to know if you see a role um, of clinical trials in, in this space um, and when should that conversation come up? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, you know, you can always bring that up to your urologist. Um, I think it's probably going to be best for patients who have had recurrences or patients who can't tolerate certain treatments. So if you're not tolerating those treatments, but you're not ready to have your bladder out, I think a clinical trial is perfect. Um, I think if you have are having lots of recurrences, a clinical trial is good. But I think at any stage of disease, um, enrolling in a clinical trial is important. Even if you're going to get a, the standard of care and not necessarily the new treatment or whatever they're testing, you know, enrolling in those clinical trials um, do help us get a lot of data. But I think in terms of uh, new treatments, I patients who have had recurrences or can't tolerate treatment, those are uh, people that your urologist should really be looking at a clinical trial for you. Um, and just as a reminder to our listeners, we have uh, on our website a clinical dashboard where you can look for clinical trials that are bladder cancer specific, and you can browse through those um, based on where you live. Now, um, I know we didn't get into um, the surgical component of it, um, but there is a question about um, bladder preservation therapies and mm -hmm. you could address that. Um, and, and when when is that offered um, uh, and any information you can share with us? Yeah, so um, in terms of bladder sparing therapies, for the most part, all non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, um, the standard of care is essentially bladder sparing. The only one that's not is if you have those very high risk features, in which case um, right now we recommend doing a cystectomy up front or even some of the variant histology, um, we recommend a cystectomy up front. Now, um, so kind of bladder sparing is 
that terminology is usually spared for, or excuse me, is usually used when we talk about patients who have muscle invasive bladder cancer, where currently the gold standard is chemotherapy and then having your bladder removed. The bladder sparing therapies are where you get chemotherapy with uh, the resection and radiation. Um, so the bladder sparing comes into play with non-muscle invasive when you've had multiple, multiple recurrences and we're getting to the point of talking about taking out your bladder. And at that point, um, if you really don't want your bladder out, we can talk about doing radiation along with chemotherapies that kind of boost the power of the radiation. Thank you. And what are some of those chemotherapy drugs used typically? When or what? Which ones? Which ones? What? Um, so uh, they're usually platinum based, so like cisplatinum, gincitabine, but then there are there are specific chemotherapies like 5-FU that actually work together with the radiation to have a better effect. So then some of them aren't necessarily the ones that you hear about with bladder cancer, but like gemcitabine and cisplatin are some of the more common ones. Thank you. And a question was submitted. I know you went over some of the side effects with, with treatment. Um, and uh, ha have you, uh, is, is uh, dizziness, dizziness and lightheadedness, is that um, a, a side effect that you normally see after BCG treatment? Um, I can't say I see, I, I don't see it often, but I have seen it before. So I don't know if that might be playing into kind of the overall immunological effect, kind of like a flu-like symptom. Maybe your blood pressure is going down, you just don't feel well. Um, so um, I have seen it before. It is more rare. Obviously, if it becomes intolerable, we can't have you dizzy, falling over, things like that. So that's something I would talk to the your urologist about. I have seen it before, though. Well, thanks for addressing that. Um, well, time has flown by, and I see we're almost at the top of the hour. So my, the last question that I have for you, Dr. Satan, and thank you again for joining us today and, and sharing this very vital information. Um, so what is uh, the, the takeaway that you want our listeners um, to take after today's uh, webinar? Um, I would have to say, you know, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, it it is it can kind of turn into a chronic disease where we're not um you know we want to cure it but we're always going to keep an eye on it you're going to you might not get one treatment you're going to get a lot of different treatments and when it comes back we might change the treatment and basically what we're trying to do with non muscle invasive is to keep it from becoming muscle invasive cuz like i said that kind of changes the paradigm so um you know uh even though you're going to require a lot of treatment, maybe a lot of surgery and a lot of different types of treatments, um, it is something that we can kind of manage for a very long time and hopefully keep from becoming muscle invasive. So I don't want patients to become discouraged when they do receive the diagnosis because it's something that we can all work together to kind of almost manage like a chronic disease. Um, and the other important thing is, you know, I wish we had more time because I see a lot of good questions in the chat and I'm a huge advocate of asking questions, asking your urologist questions, and just really trying to understand what is going on with your disease because you are your best advocate. And so I don't ever want anyone to ever stop being curious and kind of asking about what I need to do next, what I need to do next. Is a clinical trial right for me? Um, so yeah, those would kind of be my big takeaways. Well, those are excellent takeaways. And we will certainly invite you back um, <laughs> for a, a part two. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And I want to also thank our sponsors, Merck and Eurogen, for making the webinars possible. Um, thank you to our listeners.